Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand. Episode 112, Kahukura and the Fairy Fisherman. This podcast is recorded in Te Whanganui Atara, on the rohe of Muau Poko, Taranaki Whanui, Te Ati Awa and Ngāti Toa Rangatira. We are generously supported by our amazing patrons. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Kahukura was a rangatira. He was not like other men, for his skin was fair like the sand on the beach below his pa. His hair was tinged with the copper-coloured glow of the sun, and in his wide-set eyes there was a look of something unearthly and far-seeing. The old men of the hapu would talk about it in the low rumbling voice of aged Tor when the shadows were short on the ground and the young men were at work in the kumara fields. See him now, said Tohe, the old fighting man with the bright scar that cut through the whirls of the moko on his cheek. Now is the time when the old men see once again the days of their youth. When the time comes that we shall make the long journey to the Rangna, we shall see strange sights in our dreams. But Kahukura is young. What does he see over Te Moana Nui Akiwa that is hidden to our eyes? There was no movement amongst the men, but their bright eyes looked over the busy pa and the tall palisade to the distant headland where a figure stood, black against the sky. Kahukura was dreaming. His eyes were open and he stood with his feet firmly braced, facing the sea and the breakers that crashed on the rocks below. A roller burst at the base of the cliff and spray hissed past him, but he made no movement. His spirit was wandering in the land of the far north, in the beautiful country of hill and forest, of river and sand, where the gulls wheel and cry, and the spirits of the dead march steadily on to Teranga, to the giant Pahutakawa tree that overhangs the doorway of death. Time after time, this dream had come to Kahukura, the dream of something waiting for him in the distant Northland. Something that called to him, urging him to venture into that country where the land ends and only the ocean surges await the toa of Aotearoa. The rangatira sighed and turned his back on the moana. Once he was old, he would tread that path with slaves to accompany him. But before that time came, he would go alone, while he was still young and the breath of life was in his nostrils. As he walked back to the pa, he could see the young men examining their fishing lines and sorting out the bone hooks. In Kahukura's coastal pa, there were many mouths to feed, and the waka went out in all weathers with trailing lines, so that their meals of aruhe and kumara, manu and kiore, might be varied with a tasty morsel of ika. In the house of entertainment that night, the young people danced and played games, while the old men and women looked on, remembering the days of their youth when their bodies were supple. Kahukura took no part in the dances. He sat in the corner with unseeing eyes, for suddenly, in the midst of the laughter and noise, a ghostly voice was sounding in his ears. Go north, Kahukura, it said. Go alone. Go to Rangiaufia. To Rangiaufia. To Rangiaufia. When the games were over and his people lay silent on their sleeping mats, Kahukura rose softly and stepped over the sleeping forms. 
only Tohe was awake. His bright eyes watched the departing rangatira as he stood in the moonlight for a moment. And then, he departed. Tohe was wise. He said nothing, not even when the tribesmen made their vain search for the missing rangatira in the morning. It had seemed to him as though Kahukura knew what he was doing, and it was safer not to meddle. Day after day, Kahukura travelled north. He stopped only when weariness overcame him. He took his rest in the shelter of rocks, on mossy patches in the forest, and in the tall grasses. Sometimes the rain chilled him, and sometimes he walked under the hot Tamanui Tara as he moved slowly across the heaven, held by the ropes with which Maui and his brothers had tied. Sometimes Marama looked down and smiled at the tiny figure that trudged on so steadily towards the end of the land. Kahukura came to a place where the Harakeke plants thrashed their long leaves in the autumn winds. Some of them were knotted firmly together, and he knew that the souls of the dead were passing by. At night, he seemed to hear the thin cries of the departed ones, but above them rose the incessant whisper, Then came a night when he heard the voice no longer. There was a great emptiness of sound, and the hissing of the waves on the sand was like an echo from the spirit world that had movement and life in it, but scarcely any noise. Kahukura closed his eyes, but sleep would not come to him. He shivered, for a faint music was coming across the water. It was coming nearer, and he heard paddles and then voices, laughing and singing. He looked across the beach, and in the darkness he saw shining lights. The lights of the Turehu, the fair-skinned fairy folk of Aotearoa. Waka were gliding on the water, which broke into little dancing lights. The Turehu were fishing. Kahukura remembered that in the half-light, when he had thrown himself down to sleep that night, he had seen parts of fish lying on the beach, yet there had been no marks of human feet to show where the fishermen had been. This must be Rangiaofia the fishing ground of the fairy people. He crept down to the water's edge. The friendly night hid him from their eyes. They were very much closer to the shore now, and he heard them saying, The net here! The net here! He could not understand the words. What is the net? The only ways Kahukura knew of catching fish were by hook and line and spear. These were fairy words, and this must be fairy magic. The waka drew closer to the shore. They were far apart, and in the great crescent between them there was a gleaming line, inside which were flashes of fire that darted to and fro in the darkness, as the fish leapt from the water. The waka touched the shore, and the turehu sprang out. Kahukura could see that the strange bubbling line must be the... what did they call it? Net. The fish were jumping everywhere, and he could hear the slap, slap of their bodies as they sprang out of the water and fell back again. The fairies were pulling the ends of the net. Kahukura came closer and mixed with them. His skin was fair like theirs, and in the darkness they did not notice that they were being helped by a mortal. Kahukura pulled at the Harakeke rope. He felt wet 
knotted rushes passing through his hands. There was a last rush of Turehu up the beach, with Kahukura in the middle of them. The small crescent of net was live with struggling mass of silver. In the meshes was a great haul of fish. The fairies dropped the end of the net and ran back to the water's edge. They seized the flapping bodies and strung them on cords, each working by himself in haste lest the dawn should come before they finished. Just like the others, Kahukura strung his cords with fish, but he did not tie a knot at the end, so that when he lifted his string, the fish slid off onto the sand. A fairy saw them falling, and he dropped his own load and came to help Kahukura tie the knot properly. When he had gone, Kahu untied it again. Then he raised his load, and again the fish slid off. Another Turehu came to his assistance. Time and again he played this trick on the unsuspecting Turehu. He was watching the eastern sky. Far over the sea, there was a faint tinge of light. It grew stronger, until he could see the bushes above the beach, and a big rock standing out of the sea like some guardian of the deep. The fairies were running to the waka with their strings of fish, but still Kahu's fish dropped off his unknotted cord, and still the fairies helped him. The light was growing strong. The fish would all have been taken away had not Kahukura delayed the fairy people. A bright beam of light shone over the ocean, lighting up the clouds. A cry of dismay rang out from the Turehu. At last, they could see a man was with them. They rushed down the beach to their waka, but they were too late. Tamanui Tara The bright, shining sun was sending his rays over the long miles of ocean. The sand turned gold in the light. The Turehu scattered and disappeared. The waka shrank and crumbled until nothing remained but a few bundles of rushes and flax stalks. The fairy voices died away. Kahukura stood alone on the shining beach. Unfortunately, the fish had disappeared. Only one thing remained. In his hands were cords of harakeke tied in a strange pattern and wet with seawater. He remembered the cry of the Turehu. The net here. It was Tohe who was first to see him return. Tohe, the wise, who gave the greeting. Haere mai, he said, Rangatira who went forth in the night as one with a purpose. Thou hast returned to the daylight, and as one who has fared far and gained rich treasure. Kahu's eyes shone. Over his shoulder, he carried a tangle of woven harakeke. The people came to the call of Kahukura, but they feared that his mind had left him, for in reply to their greetings, all he said was, The net! The net! The young men took out the long nets that Kahukura had taught them to make, for he had studied the tying of the knots as he journeyed home. Instead of a single fish flapping on the hook or on the barb of the spear, The young men now brought in a teeming harvest of ika, and there was plenty for rangatira and toa, for wives and sons and daughters, and even for slaves. This was the gift which Kahukura won from the Turehu fishermen at Rangiaofia in the long ago. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A, 
R-O-A. You can also find helpful resources there, like transcripts, sources, and translations for some of the Te Reo Māori we have used. You can help support Hans through Patreon, buying merch, or giving us a review. It means a lot and helps spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, haere tu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time.